D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. The crowds who welcomed Jesus on Palm Sunday later shouted, Crucify Him on Good Friday. They completely misunderstood Jesus, as does a new Hollywood movie. We will take a look at the real Jesus and the movie The Shack on today's Truths That Transform. Welcome to Truths That Transform, a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries, where we are standing for truth and defending your freedom. On this Palm Sunday edition of our program, we separate the facts from the fiction about Jesus Christ. Later on the program, you'll discover how the Hollywood blockbuster film, The Shack, misrepresents Jesus, also God, and the nature of the gospel. And you will find out what makes Jesus absolutely unique among the world's religious figures. As we begin, we are reminded that the historically verified death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are the foundation upon which rests the entire Christian faith. If his death and resurrection are untrue, then our faith in him is in vain also. Here to speak with us about this is Dr. Paul Meyer a widely published author and emeritus professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University. Dr. Meyer, what a delight to have you with us today. Good to be with you, Dr. Wright. Thank you so much. Well, when we're talking about the resurrection, the elephant in the room question is, did he really rise from the dead or should we interpret those texts in some spiritual manner? As a Christian, I firmly believe he did rise from the dead and I can almost prove it as an ancient historian or professor of ancient history, as a matter of fact. I was so fascinated by the biblical events years ago, even from Sunday school days, that I always wondered, is there some outside evidence by which we could guarantee that what the Bible is telling us is true? And so I went into ancient history to get the context right. in which the Old and New Testament were written. And I was amazed to see how much there is out there which beautifully supports the concept of the resurrection. For example, take a, a secular source like Cornelius Tacitus. He's a first century Roman historian. Talks about the great fire of Rome. It happened in 64 AD. Mm -hmm. And how Nero got blamed for it. In order to save himself, he switches the blame to the Christians. Then he explains who the Christians are. They're named for a Christ who was crucified by one of our governors, Pontius Pilate, and how the pernicious superstition almost died until suddenly it gained new vigor. Now there you have an outside demonstration of Easter and Pentecost, suddenly gained new vigor and even flowed into Rome, that common cesspool into which everything hateful comes from all over the Mediterranean. Hostile source, right? right. But nevertheless, as an ancient historian, I love the fact that we have here positive proof in a hostile source. This becomes self-authenticating. It's one of the rules in history that the criterion of embarrassment, it's called, is right. absolute proof that these things actually happen. So here's one source. We have about six more in the ancient world testifying to the resurrection itself. Lawyers love that too, don't they? When you have hostile testimony that confirms your basic thesis, it's more powerful than any other evidence, isn't it? Exactly. I know of no religious system that is capable to more defense than Christianity on the basis of the surrounding evidence of the ancient world. And by the way, Frank, we can prove the empty tomb. I mean, prove. Uh, uh, you accept the resurrection on faith because we can't categorically prove it to everyone's satisfaction. We'd have six or billion or seven billion Christians today if we could. But in the case of the empty tomb, uh, I was able to bring out enough evidence that if we use the canons of historical history correctly, that uh, there is no question but that the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, in which Jesus was buried on Friday, was in fact empty on Sunday morning. And I'm not trying to say an empty tomb proves a resurrection, right. but reverse it. You can't have a resurrection 
at least a decent one, <laughs> without the tomb being empty as its first symptom. How does the historic evidence for the resurrection of Christ compare to other important facts of antiquity? We, first of all, have no real claim of a resurrection elsewhere. So this is unique, for one thing. Uh, another is, and I'm not trying to say that we can prove only the empty tomb and not the resurrection. Right. No, right. Uh, we also have tremendous importance tremendously important proofs on the resurrection. Right. Just listen to your Christian pastor on Sunday. But uh, we have, uh, again, so much else by way of material crossovers into the secular world uh, that you can see that we're dealing here not with a specially different kind of history, but really part and parcel of what did happen to real people 2,000 plus years ago at a real place on earth called mm -hmm. Palestine. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 50 names in the Old Testament, which are well known both in the Old Testament and in secular surrounding ancient history. We have 37 names in the New Testament, shorter book of course, 37 very famous names that are dealing with uh, certainly facts that we know as Christians, but also that the ancients knew. You know, beginning with the, uh, the, the, the great founder of uh, uh, the Roman Empire, Augustus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the Christmas story begins with Augustus. Uh, and this is another example of how Luke, of all the authors in the scriptures, is always trying to throw an anchor out into the gr mainstream of Greco-Roman history to point out these things were not done in a corner and in some special never-never land or another dimension. No, part and parcel of what did happen in the past. Well, Dr. Meyer, thanks for being with us. It's a delight to have you here this week with us. Well, it's good to see you. Good to see you, too. A bit later in the program, you'll discover some of the misrepresentations of Jesus and the gospel contained in the new film, The Shack. And we'll share a new resource with you that guides you to the peace that Christ's death and resurrection offers all of us. But first, around this time of year, there is much talk about Jesus but often the truth gets lost. Just who is this remarkable man who calls himself the Son of God? Dr. Kennedy shares biblical insights in this portion of his message, The Real Jesus. Who is this mysterious, wondrous person who has indeed changed the whole world more than any other person that has ever lived. Who is the real Jesus? Well, we often hear it said that he was a great man, but really nothing more. I would like to take a close look today at who Jesus Christ really is and to call to bear witness, firstly, God the Father Almighty. What does he say? Well, when Jesus first began his ministry, when he was baptized at Jordan by John, you recall that a dove, symbol of the Holy Spirit, descended, and a voice was heard saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You notice God didn't say, This is one of my sons. This is a son of God but this is my beloved Son. John 3.16 makes it very clear, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. And that is who Jesus Christ is. He's the only begotten Son of God. Well, what does Jesus have to say about himself? Many things. Jesus declares this, I am the Father are one. He further says, after his resurrection, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Did you ever stop to think about that? All power in heaven and in earth. Jesus Christ is omnipotent, one of the many attributes of God Almighty. 
Not only is he omnipotent, but God, who is the judge of all of the earth, declares that all judgment is given unto the Son, that he may be equal with the Father. He is the judge of all of the world. Furthermore, he raises the dead. He gives life to whomsoever he will. That is what Jesus says. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, Philip, have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Not only through the Scripture, but throughout history, the greatest of men and women have declared the glories of Jesus Christ. Who was the greatest military genius of all time? Napoleon Bonaparte. And one day, he was discussing the divinity of Christ with his most faithful general, General Bertrand. And General Bertrand was an unbeliever. But Napoleon replied, I know men. Who would doubt that? And I tell you that Jesus Christ is not a man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and any other religion whatsoever the distance of infinity. We can say to the authors of every other religion, ye are neither gods nor the agents of deity. You are but missionaries of falsehood, molded from the same clay and filled with the same sins of other mortals. Their passions and vices are inseparable from you. Your temples and your priests reveal your origins. Behold the destiny near at hand of him whom the whole world called the great Napoleon. What an abyss between my deep misery and the eternal reign of Christ, which is proclaimed, loved, adored, and which is extending all over the world. Is that to die? Is it not rather to live? The death of Christ is the death of God. Silence. Bertrand did not respond. And then at length, Napoleon solemnly added, If you do not perceive that Jesus Christ is God, very well then. I made a mistake to make you a general. As Dr. Kennedy shared in his message today, Jesus uniquely claims to be the Son of God and Messiah. And he backed up those claims by rising from the dead before hundreds of witnesses. Jesus tells us that believing in him is how we are saved from our sins and made right with our Heavenly Father. But a new movie based on a best-selling book turns these biblical truths upside down by cloaking them in the ancient heresy of universal salvation. Here's our own Dr. Jerry Newcomb with more. Christians today often have very strong opinions, pro or con, toward the book and now the movie, The Shack. While many have felt it helps them understand their painful experiences, theologians and pastors note that it does so at the expense of skewing the biblical picture of God. I would argue that technically it's blasphemous. It is so egregiously wrong in its depiction of um, the God of the Bible and the Son of God of the Bible. 
Um, and it shows the, the, first of all, the extent of the biblical ignorance of our population, which is our fault. The Shack deals with Mac, a man who has suffered a horrible loss, the murder of his little daughter, having discovered her blood-stained dress in a shack. He's mysteriously invited to return to the shack to meet God there. But there are problems with the depiction of God in the book and the movie, beginning with its depiction of the Trinity. When the book came out and it had such a popular reception, I was depressed because it is, it is impossible to recognize any orthodox with a small o understanding of God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit from reading the shack. Mackenzie Allen Phillips. I've been looking forward to this. Do I know you? Not very well, but we can work on that. The book and film portray God the Father as a woman. Writing a review for The Shack for the Chicago Tribune, Katie Walsh describes the movie's version of the Trinity, as in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as a trio of groovy spiritual teachers in a tropic wooded paradise. She derisively calls the place the God Spa. But God is not male or female. God is spirit. God's not 51% male and 49% female. While God the Father does not have biological sex characteristics the way humans do, theologians point out that we dare not dismiss the masculine descriptions of God in the Bible. That's ridiculous. Everyone knows he has no sex. Sure. Well, yeah. that, if that is the case, why, why did Jesus Christ say, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven? So why did Christ say that? He didn't use the word Father. He used Abba. the word Abba. He did which not, means dad, I, I'm astonished. daddy, He said, pa pater hemon, ho en no, tois oranois. He did Our not father speak. is what he said. No, yeah. he did uh, not. Another serious problem with the shack is its universalism, the idea that everyone will be saved regardless of their faith. Christian universalism teaches that in the end, everybody does go to heaven after all because in hell, those who refuse to believe on Christ prior to death will, under the chastening fires that God will bring into their lives, their experience in hell, cause them to repent, believe on Christ, and go to heaven. So this is Christian universalism. So the end result is still the same. Everybody gets to heaven. The shack is just fiction, argue those in favor of the book and movie's message of redemption. However, William Paul Young, the author of The Fictional Shack, has said that he wrote the book to convey his theology to his children. And he's just now come out with a nonfiction book declaring important biblical truths as lies we believe about God. Such supposed lies include God is good, I am not. God is in control. The cross was God's idea. Sin separates us from God. Furthermore, he declares the need to be saved a lie and writes, God does not wait for my choice and then save me. Are you suggesting that everyone is saved, that you believe in universal salvation? That is exactly what I am saying, end quote. Why then is the shack so popular among Christians today? The shack is popular among Christians for several reasons. There's a general... Uh, sense going on in American culture today that uh, the postmodern world has passed the modern world and everything has become relative and therefore the exclusiveness of Christ doesn't fit into that uh, uh, present scheme of things. But if we want to believe that there's a reality called heaven, we have to believe in the reality called hell. It's surprising that from within the ranks of those who call themselves evangelical, there would be such an unembarrassed embrace of positions that are anything but evangelical, that are directly antithetical to the gospel we've received uh, and to the gospel preached by the apostles, handed down by Christ. You know, whether it's universalism or inclusivism or the denial of hell and the embrace of annihilationism, uh, th these things are not new. But the important thing is they come back and for any given generation they sound new. Dr. D. James Kennedy tells of one sharing the gospel with a lady and he happened to mention the reality of God punishing wayward souls in hell. She threw up her hands in holy horror and said, Oh, never, 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 no, 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 she said. My 
God would never do anything like that. I said, Madam, excuse me, you are absolutely right. Your God would never do anything like that. But of course, your God would never do anything else either. For your God does not exist except as a figment of your imagination, as the idol of your mind. All kinds of forces are going on today really to bombard the Christian and to confuse the Christian as to what is the truth. I am very much convinced when Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, that he is the way, the truth and the life. If we come to him, we will find deliverance, we'll find victory from both the penalty of sin and the power of sin. But he is the way and any aberration of that and distortion of that will have eternal consequences. As you've just seen, the truth about God can be twisted or sometimes forgotten, even when people think they have good motives. But the truth about God and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ is the only sure footing we have in this world and the only hope we have in the next. We have some new resources that will anchor those truths in your soul like never before. And here's my very good friend, Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy, to tell us more about them. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Frank. Is it possible to live without fear? What is our eternal hope? And how can it help us right now in our daily lives, especially in these tumultuous times? To answer those questions, we've put together a new four DVD set called Living Without Fear featuring four powerful messages from my father, Dr. D. James Kennedy. In this series, my dad looks at ending financial fears, banishing the fear of death, and conquering fear, among others. If you are able to give a generous donation of $60 or more to the ongoing work of our ministry, we'll send you the four DVD set, Living Without Fear, plus the book of the same name, which features two bonus messages that are not included on the DVD set. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll-free, 877-962-7677. Or go online to djkm.org. There is so much falsehood in our culture, and biblical truth is needed more than ever. We want to continue producing programs with strong biblical content that proclaim Jesus and the true gospel to a lost and dying world. But we can't do it without your help. So please contact us right away. And for a limited time, if you are able to give a generous donation of $60 or more, in addition to the DVD and book set, we'll also include the unique audio CD, Peaceful Meditation. This relaxing CD features a biblical reflection from my father on the 23rd Psalm, plus beautiful, rich hymns of the Christian faith played on harp. That's the four DVD set, Living Without Fear, the book of the same name featuring two bonus messages not contained on the discs, and the Peaceful Meditation CD, all as our thanks for your generous donation of just $60 or more to the ongoing work of this ministry. Or you can have just the book as our thanks for your generous donation of any amount. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339. Or call toll free, 877-962-7677. Or go online to djkm.org. Easter is the season when TV networks and major news media drag out their shop-worn skeptics in an effort to debunk the essential facts of Christianity. This year, ahead of Easter, CNN has been airing the program Believer with Reza Aslan, featuring a professing Muslim who wrote a best-selling book, Casting Doubt on the Historicity of the Gospel Accounts of Jesus' Life and his ministry. 
In a recent column for CNN.com, Aslan declared, I am Muslim not because I think Islam is truer than other religions. It isn't. The water I draw from it is the same water drawn from everyone else's wells. Well, this bromide is a common sentiment in our day. And while it has the ring of humility, in reality, it is arrogance and misstatement of the first order. First, Aslan's postmodern view completely ignores the obvious fact that most religions make contradictory and irreconcilable truth claims. It is impossible to say we are drinking from the same well if every other bucket we raise has something different in it. As the Apostle Paul says, if Jesus has not truly bodily risen from the dead, our faith is useless. Aslan, in his effort to be politically correct, does a disservice not only to Jesus, but even to the Muhammad he claims to follow by not taking their own words seriously. And second, when Aslan claims to know that all religions are actually drinking from the same well, he's claiming to know more about God than any individual religion does. While Christianity and Islam present mutually contradictory truth claims, Aslan is claiming a higher knowledge that overrules them both. Humility would not be the best descriptor of such a claim. Instead, we must recognize his reasoning is erroneous. On Palm Sunday, the crowds cried out as Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, either he is or he isn't. As C.S. Lewis memorably put it, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. D. James Kennedy Ministries is standing for truth and defending your freedom. We'll see you next week for our Easter program featuring Lee Strobel, among others. I'm Frank Wright. Thanks for joining us for Truths That Transform. Next week on Truths That Transform. I was happy in my sin. I didn't want to change my life. And, you know, I had a difficult relationship with my father. That. My friend, is Easter morning without the resurrection? That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.